what I thought um, to discuss in this presentation is basically what MedSafe is up to next, because there have been quite a lot of changes. Uh, some of them uh, have generated quite a bit of curiosity from the community as well. So to the next slide, it says something like data and perpetuity. Uh, can you tell me like what does perpetuity mean to you all uh, if, if for data, of course, uh, in internet? Like, do you think it is something important? And if it, if it is important, why do you think it is important? Perpetuity. Yes. Like, if you upload data, for instance, should that remain there forever, or should it be? Depends on the type of data. Obviously, there's certain reference data right. that we would all want to have available all the time. Right. Such as our what we treasure, cultural treasures, for example. Yes. And other things, you know. But that's a matter of personal taste. What you might prefer above that. Is that to be in the cloud, permanently available? Yes. And who do you think should be the arbiter of that? Everybody. And there lies the problem, right? <laughs> right? So, you can have a... See, like, if all data was ever perpetual, right? So, so you have no choice. So say there was a cancer research paper, for instance, that could have been uh, important for somebody, right? Um, and the medical institutions kind of, or, or organizations, they take it off because they want to have a monopoly or something like that. Made up reason, right? So that's certainly should have been perpetual so that people can benefit out of it. Uh, some other data might be personal data, which you might be inclined, why should I have that always over there? Well, think of it in this term. Say you upload something to the net and then you take it off, say it is in Google Drive or Dropbox. Do you really have a guarantee that it's no more there? So, so any data that you upload to the internet, you can almost think it is always going to remain over there. Right. You've donated that to the data you have. Example, to the permanent cloud that's going to be mined forever. Exactly, right? And if it is that sensitive to you, and you don't want people to find out, you should have done some encryption. But right? you encrypt it and then upload it, then it's useless for people. They will still harvest it, because maybe in the next 300 years, you might break some encryption and then find out what it was. But then there's no real uh, protection against that anyway. Already you've got the problem with academic papers and stuff like that, what's called link rot, haven't you? The, the papers are still there, but the links are missing because of Pauli and Fickley yes. and whatever other reasons. Very important point as well, right? And that's what the Internet Archive guys are doing. They're, they're trying to kind of make this huge petabyte and petabyte of storage, uh, or they're trying to find one because they need to upload all that stuff to somewhere on the Internet so that people can find it. Now. The first point is probably the only important point for perpetuity because if you give the control about what data should be perpetual and what data shouldn't be, then you have conflicts. Uh, some countries might not be as free as some other countries and they might think that this shouldn't be perpetual or if you, if you upload something against the, the prime minister or the president of the country, maybe that shouldn't be perpetual. So for all that stuff, we can bundle everything under censorship. We can say that uh, the network should not or should be censorship resistant. Right? Um, that basically means that whatever you upload will remain forever, so be careful in what you're uploading. If you don't want people to find out, encrypt it. Right? But it will be there all that. So even if somebody downloads your data and it's encrypted, then it's, it's, it's kind of useless for them. Uh, unless you share the keys, of course. So th that is the main reason why MateSafe has gone for adopting this perpetual web and data concept. Uh, it is Taxing on the network, it's not easy for the network because anything that is perpetual will eventually cause a bloat, right? And anything that causes a bloat will kind of stymie other people's data getting in. So, but still, do you think that is the right thing to do? And hence, it is that way. At this point, can I ask a question? Of course, you can just issue So, questions. say your data is personal to you and my data is personal to me, but 30% of our data is actually the same. You've got a but because your data is linked to your ID and my data is linked to my ID, you yeah. can't even deduplicate the data then. You can. Uh, uh, yes, and we've also come to that uh, if, if the data is non-owned. If, if you are happy for the data to be non-owned, so if you want the data to be owned, uh, which basically means that you are kind of producing some kind of, kind of digital signature for that, saying that I am X and here's my signature, therefore I own the data, that cannot be deduplicated. So somebody has to make a copy of that if they also want to say that I also own that, right, for the reasons of uh, security. 
Uh, but if you are happy to not claim the ownership for the data, then it's fine. Uh, you just upload the data, you upload an MP3 file, for instance, and if I upload the same MP3 file, I don't really want to claim ownership, right? I just want to access it as long as it's there, fine. In those cases, we deduplicate data very much so. So we'll also talk about that, but that's really important. Yeah. So then there is a certain need for mutability. For instance, uh, certain use cases become very difficult if you have something that cannot be mutated at all. Uh, so the front end, uh, so we may say it's basically divided into two, right? So we have the front end team that does the web and the apps and all that stuff, and there's the back end team which does the networking part. Of it. So they require requests, they are the clients, and uh, we make sure the routing and the trust and whatever layers of made safe are, they all they work properly. Uh, they said, and, and they gave a very good example saying that assume that we have something like an inbox, right? An email inbox, which we are all familiar with. And now assume that it is perpetual, right? So, so it never gets deleted, that's fine. But what if you have a use case, because things need to be usable as well, that you go to a particular mail and you mark it red because you've read it. And then you change your mind and then you mark it unread, for example. So it's a very simple example. If you have a Boolean flag, and you can keep copying that, you can say that, okay, it's red now, and then next time it's unread. So whenever the app uh, downloads the stuff, it will check the Boolean flag and it will say that whether the mail is red or not. But, but if something is permanent or is immutable, and that, that's what perpetuity means, you cannot copy that Boolean flag anymore. So you need to come up with some weird logic saying that I'll have one more stuff, saying that that is actually not red anymore. And then if you try to make it red, then preempt that or like add more stuff and say that it is red. So you basically have a list of this mail is red, unread, red, unread, red, unread, unread, and whatever is the last one is the one that you choose, right? And you're laughing because it's weird, right? It's very weird. And that's what they exactly said that. This is old in trial. That's very weird. So, so, so that, that's what they said. They said like, it, it is going to work. It's a great idea, but it's not going to be usable. Finding the people need to use it, otherwise it's a stillborn network, right? So, so that was one of the reasons why we thought mutability might be required, but we don't want to uh, challenge the censorship one, right? So we want that point to be there as well. So we'll see how we do some things. Um, the other one is the prevent load of unneeded personal data. So if you have some personal data and uh, you encrypt that and you put it and then you change something that changes the data completely because an encrypted data is a random thing, right? You change one stuff, and you get, then the encryption with your key should produce a completely random, unrecognizable stuff again. Yeah. So the previous one is useless now. So the network could be bloated with immense amount of those, so that might uh, necessitate the need for mutability. So those, those are like just two examples. There might be more, right? At the moment. So how do you have mutability and permanence both? Uh, we went for different kinds of data. So what? The, the, the high level distribution is something like this. We call something published data, which is gettable by everyone, and we call something unpublished data, which is only gettable by the owner, like the person who has uploaded it. So if you upload something which you want the world to see, you have to upload it as published. Otherwise, nobody but you can upload it. And once you upload it as published, that falls into the category of complete immutability, so you cannot reclaim it. You, you can do certain things like append only, I will come to that, but you cannot overwrite anything. You cannot overwrite history, so it's there to make the history forever, right? So that is your published data. And the unpublished one, we don't really care because you're not kind of sharing with anyone. So, but remember that made safe uh, vaults run on user computers, right? So it's running on your computer, your computer, or everybody else's computer. If you decide to be kind of malicious or for whatever reason, and you say that, okay, I'll honor the delete request, I'll give you an illusion that your data is deleted, but I won't delete it, I'll actually keep it somewhere else. That's fine. Then it's up to the client to have encrypted that data. We cannot prevent that anything, right? Because it's going to the user computer. At that point, we can't just prevent anything from happening. Right? So encrypt your data. So although you can say it is unpublished, it still resides on people's computer. The majority of the vaults are the good, good actors, which is what the network completely depends on. Depends on the majority of good actors are not going to honor the get requests from that. So if, if you publish something that is personal, if I try to get it, even if I know the name of the data, uh, the, the walls are not going to give me, so I'm not going to get it. Those data, you have complete control over, right? If you want, you can completely delete it, whether it's actually deleted by the walls and stuff like that, we don't care. Uh, 
as far as you are concerned, you have your space back, you can upload things to that space, right? And probably, um, if it's not worked out how the, the monetization of all that work, I mean monetization in the sense that uh, you pay for something and then you delete it, then you have a space free, then next time you upload to that space, are you charged less and all that stuff? It's not worked out, probably there'll be some incentivizing factor to delete uh, uploading uh, data, right? So that, that is about the unpublished and the published data. Right, so we have something called append only. So append only means you have a data, but you cannot overwrite the history of that. If you want any changes to happen, you have to append to that. So, so that is a kind of a published data in a way, right? So if you make an, a published inbox, then there is no other way to make it apart from keep adding the Boolean flags, true, false, true, false for the uh, red, unread part, right? Uh, unless you can come up with something clever. But that's the idea of append only data. You have data, you decide to change it, you append to it, you never overwrite it. So that belongs to the category of published data. The, over, the other one is the overwritable that is equal to the banks, which we just went over. That is uh, what you call the, the personally owned data. So, uh, we also have further division as sequenced and unsequenced. And now, why that is required is uh, say multiple people are trying to. Or, you have multiple apps which are trying to mutate a data, right? So, so you have a data and you dedicate three apps to kind of mutate it. Or maybe you're running apps on different uh, machines, like I was just running my email uh, thing on the mobile and forwarded the link, and he's running it on his uh, laptop. So maybe they're all uh, going and converging to the same data. In that one, you have a choice. So if, if it is, um, do you guys use GitHub? Right, so, so if you use something like GitHub, you know that your next comment should be based on the previous comment and so on and so forth, right? Otherwise, you'll get some kind of conflict if it can't make a proper history out of it. So in those cases, it is important what your existing data is. And if the existing data is this, only then your next change should make any sense is your requirement. In that case, you go for sequence data. So by sequence, what it means is if, if, if the current data number, for instance, this state number, right? The current data number or the record number is five, what you're saying is the next record should be only six, so it shouldn't be more than that or less than that. So if two people are mutating, they will compete for that space saying that uh, based on this five, my change should go as six, and somebody else will say that based on the same five, my change should go as six, but those two changes are different. And you don't want both of them to get on. That is, that is the, the, the precondition of sequence data. So the walls is are random data. It's not random, it depends on which came first and stuff, but because of the eventual consistency and all, it becomes quite random which one gets chosen first. So one of them will be chosen and the other one will be rejected as a conflict, and which is a good thing because that person probably did not want that data to get in after four was uh, followed by, or four, uh, once the record increased from four to five, right? Because he was basing his changes on, say, four or something. So that, that is sequence data. In certain other cases, you don't really care. For instance, one is progress bar, right? So if, if multiple people are trying to kind of increase the progress bar, you don't really care who increased it. As, as long as the delta is always positive, you're just seeing the progress of something. That's a stupid example, but there are cases where you don't really care about sequencing. Like if this is three, I'm not basing my changes on record three. I just want my record four to go because it's, it's kind of unrelated. And if somebody else is making a change, that person might also not uh, think or not care whether the record increments from three to four or whatever it is. In that case, you go for unsequenced, and the advantage, as you can notice, is the speed. A lot of people can make changes, and all those changes are going to be honored. Right? So, so you fire uh, update requests like mad, and all those requests are getting uh, multiplexed or kind of uh, getting honored by the boards. So that is the, the advantage of unsequenced. Uh, published and unpublished, we went over it. So we have a new concept. I don't know how much you are following made say before this, but before that we just had a concept of get, uh, which used to get data, but now because of the published and unpublished, you have something called owner get, which is a special kind of get, uh, which the vaults will verify the sender of the owner get is actually the owner of the data, and then uh, give them the unpublished data. The published data is free to get for everybody, so everybody can get published. That's the right? Okay, I have a link that shows you the structure and then goes into further details. I'll come back to that if you guys want to go into more technical depth. 
uh, immutable data. So, so the previous one we saw was mutable data, which was divided into published and unpublished, append only, uh, and unpublished could be unsequenced, sequenced, published could also be unsequenced, sequenced. But what is immutable data? Immutable data is what uh, is, is something that that will kind of uh, reflect what he was talking about about deduplication. So immutable data basically means that it, it, it's not that you cannot mutate it or something. It is immutable because of a different reason, a surprising reason. It is immutable because the address of the data depends on the data itself, right? So imagine if you are writing a letter to somebody, right? So the envelope is not kind of very related to the content. So you can put in anything that has a content and write an address and send that stuff, right? So, so the address and the content of the envelope is not related. So in those cases, you can change the content, but keep the address same, so it's still the same person. And that's how you correspond in mails, right? So you keep uh, different kind of mails to the same person, and the same person receives it. In mutable data, however, imagine that you don't actually have to write an address on the envelope. When you fill it, when you put some letter inside the envelope, the address is magically generated depending on some criteria which arises from the data itself, from the, from the thing that you're putting in the envelope itself. So you have no control over the address, actually. Now if you change the content, if you put in a new letter, it is bound to come up with a new address, so it doesn't at all go to the same address again. That's why it is mutable, because once you put it, since the address was derived from the content, it goes to a particular location. If you change the data, it will go to a different location. So that location and the data over there is now immutable. Again, two types of data over here, published and unpublished. Published, you cannot delete it. It's there forever. And unpublished, you can delete it, right? And owner get is the same thing. If you do an owner get, that's the only way to get the unpublished, in which the network will make sure that you are the owner of the data. And for the published, you can just get it. The next point is the deduplication of them. So, so how do we do the deduplication, right? So the, the MP3 file, again, for example, if you uploaded your MP3 file and somebody else uploaded their MP3 file, and if the file was exactly the same, you don't really care uh, who owns it at that point, right? If you publish that data. If you don't publish it, you keep it unpublished, then you care because you own it. But in case of a published one, you don't really care. Now that MP3 file's address when it goes to the network, as I said, is magically generated from the file content itself, which is the MP3 file. So because you both have the same MP3 file, it is obviously going to the same address. The network is going to give you both an illusion that it has saved the thing for you, but what it does cleverly is saves only the first copy, the second copy will go, ah, it's already there, it's not going to do anything with it, but it's going to charge you. Well, I'm sure there's a backup copy of this, right? There will be backup copies, yeah. but so far in the network, uh, it, it doesn't go to a single wall, right? So all these things, because MadeSafe has a concept of group consensus, so everything that may say is either a section or a group, but to keep the discussion simple, we can say that uh, we form groups in the network, and those groups are responsible, they, they, those groups know certain other groups, they know certain other groups, and that's why you can traverse from one end of the network to the other, although not everybody knows everybody, but they know somebody who knows uh, more somebody and so on and so forth, right? Can I ask, if you have like, a really large would it cause issues working out with the addresses just because it's really long or something? Yeah, so, so what happens is the address is magically always 32 bytes, no matter the size of the file, right? So one function that you know that does it, uh, very simply, is a hash function. So if you take a hash of a content, it doesn't really matter what the content is, uh, it matters what the content is. I mean, it doesn't matter what the content size is, because the hash is always going to be 32 bytes, right? If, if you even add a full stop at the end of that, a proper hashing algorithm should create a completely different kind of hash that doesn't even make sense when you look at the previous one, right? You had like a huge composition, say like MBs of composition, and all you did was add a full stop. That will generate a hash which is 32 bytes, which is completely different from uh, the hash without the full stop thing, right? So, so, so that, that, that's a good hash function. Uh, a bad hash function will cause a lot of hash solutions. So if, if you have a content that hashes to something, you might find another content that hashes to the same thing that we call a hash collision. In MadeSafe, we, we basically think that there shouldn't be any hash collisions because the, the space is huge. The space is 32 bytes, which basically means 256 bits. So you have 2 to the power 256 minus 1 combinations of like binary ones and zeros, right? which is very difficult to find. So, so you have a good space over there. 
uh, but yes, so it, it doesn't actually depend on the, the size of your file. Any size file you put into a hash function it will generate something that is 32 bytes, but you cannot reverse that. You cannot take a 32 byte. It, it wouldn't take no way if the file was large as well. It would take a bit longer, yes. I guess it takes that if you are back. Exactly. Because it does something to the file, right? So, so even the reading of that would take a bit longer. It's something that the file would generate 32 bytes. Uh, but uh, that longer will be much smaller than you uploading the thing in the network because the network latency is going to beat everything up, right? Uh, so great. So you have an MP3 file, somebody else has the same MP3 file or any kind of file. If they are both the same, they are bound to hash to the same address. It goes to the same address. The network just goes, I'm going to be the illusion that I'm storing both of them, but I'll charge you both. I'm storing this one. Uh, and your question about uh, distributing it more, it might, we might, but the thing is, I mean, yes, I'm only saying that because if there was actually, if you only stored one, one, and just one, one, uh, right? and then, yeah, for yeah. everybody, yes, you know, the chances are it could get corrupted. Well, that exactly. must be a duplicate somewhere. Exactly. So, or, or if you just stored it in one node, that node could be yeah, lost or out, something yeah. like that. Right? So what happens in the say if you form a group, and group size may be like 100, it's still being debated, it's part of the design. So around about 100, uh, it seems to be a good number, right? And it's not easy to form a group, like you cannot just be a part of a group running a board, you know, because that would be terrible, because then you just have like casual actors just being a part of the group, and then at some point they'll just close the computers and then the whole thing collapses. Well, I mean, if you think about it, um, People are going to adopt, they're going to cherish the information that they personally cherish. They're going to find a node that is storing information that's valuable to them, but they also respect as information. Yes. So basically, you're going to try and support nodes that believe in the same things as you. Yes, yes. And those nodes can be born, right? So if, if there is some malicious actor that kind of deletes the information or something, we have a group that will recognize that this actor is not acting according to whatever it is, and then they, they won't earn. There has to be some kind of an incentivizing factor, as you said, right? So those who do the right thing should get something in return so that it encourages them to do the right thing. And that right, and that thing is safe point. So you basically earn money, and if safe point once it has a value. But within the network, there can be nodes which with absolutely counter-opposing points of view. Yes. Uh, and uh, But there's no reason for them to attack each other. Yes. But they can exist independent of each other. They can. And, allow, and the network will allow them the freedom of their beliefs. Yes. Regardless. Yes. And, and just like uh, in normal situations, uh, as you work for something longer, you get more and more trust, right? Any organization as well. If you work for a council, for instance, for a long time, you get some trust in the council. So it's the same thing. Uh, you just don't become a part of the group because you switch on the computer and ran a board. You have to do a lot of things in order to gain something called node age, something like human age, for instance. So each time you do something and the network does something to you and it recognizes that you are doing a good thing, it will keep adding age to you. Once you reach a certain age, you have gained some level of trust. At that point, you are expected to do the right thing because you have invested so much in gaining that age. And now if you don't do the right thing and the network detects that you did something delicious, it's going to kill you. And you don't want that investment to go blank, right? So if you've run a node for 10 years, maybe, paid off electricity bills and stuff, you now want to earn money out of it. And now if you do try to do something delicious, because now you've been given the, the trust, and the network detects that you did something, we run a risk of losing everything, all right? So, so those are the things, kind of stuff that is built into the network that prevents you from randomly deleting data and doing all that. If you haven't gained enough respect from the network, which means that the network hasn't allocated enough age to you, it is not even going to ask you to store something, or even if it does, it will just ask you to store it for the sake of it. Like it doesn't expect you to really store it. Even if you forget it, that's fine. If you, if you don't forget it, it will keep adding age to you, but there will be other enough nodes with proper age that will be actually storing the data. So you did a probably will Can I ask about like yes. age and error thing? Like, it sounds basically like if you turned off from the data, then it doesn't. But is that sort of, can you sort of transfer? Because like if you've had your computer for 10 years, it's like, 
the hard disk spent dodge it and only to fix a new one so you would have to change out. Yeah. Would you be able to move the vault over and how long would you be able to log out to maintain your old status? Absolutely. So those are the algorithms, right? So what happens is, uh, let, let me try and put it in an in interesting way instead of a very important way. Uh, when you go to the network, the network knows you because you have some key, right? Some cryptographic key, which only you can know unless you gave it to someone. Right? So when you go offline and you come back online, right? What the network will do is it'll try to halve your age if, if you come back soon enough. Now, what that's soon enough is not defined in terms of time. It's defined in terms of network progression because time is a logic thing, right? Because what, what is one second to you may be something different to me and people might not agree. So what we say is, if the network has progressed from state zero to state 10, whatever the state is like, maybe each state is a, in terms of blockchain, maybe it's each block, right? In terms of parser graph, maybe it's like number of consensus events that you have. So once you have certain number of that X that match with the X, which is not time, and if you are back within that time, maybe it doesn't do anything. Maybe it doesn't even half a rate because it knows that you must have done an upgrade, you must have replaced your hard disk or something like that. If you come back after that, it will half your rate and bunch you to some other part of the network so that you join over there and start getting your rate. So it kind of incentivizes you from going offline for a very long time. Uh, which also means that you're online for a long time, you've invested a lot of resource, so you're not going to be right? So, so yes. Uh, also to remember guys that for the front end, everything is user centric, right? It's, it's the user finally usable. It's the UX find and all that stuff, the user experience. Right? The back end cares about user experience, of course, obviously it defaults to say it doesn't, but it cares about the network much more. If it comes to protecting the network versus protecting the user, it will always choose the network for the greater good, right? So yes, so if you're offline for a long time, although you have been there for 10 years, Maybe you have genuine reasons, but then if it does allow you, then it allows certain other kind of behavior which might become malicious and stuff. So we're kind of not going to do that. Okay, so replay prevention. That is that is one thing. I, I won't go into VLC because I think it's too technical. I'll go to replay prevention. Uh, you guys can come back to the end and uh, at the end and say, like, if you want me to go more technical, I'll go. Uh, replay pre prevention is important whenever you read something. Right? Because you had a data and say like I was man in the middle kind of stuff and I swooped upon it, right? So I have the data. Now two years later you delete that data. Fine. I can just replay it and then republish it, right? So that's bad. Imagine that uh, you had some kind of a contract with somebody and that contract had done some revision. So that person was okay, this contract is at version five, and I believe version five of the terms and conditions and ends I uh, Connect to this company or this person or whatever it is, right? Uh, now you can delete the data, republish it, and keep bumping up the version because every update will bump up the version. Go back to version five and completely change the terms and conditions or change some of the whatever, right? And now it does not have the same terms and conditions which people can delete and that you kind of have fooled them successfully or something like that. So, so you need to prevent all that. Uh, and if you deleted your data and somebody else you know, replayed your original creation request, then data can be reput and all that stuff. So we have something called unique message IDs, and that prevents uh, replay, right? Because the network keeps track of all the message IDs that the, the user is sending to the wards, and you cannot, and, and it'll make sure that every new request has a new message ID. So if somebody tries to replay your old message, uh, it'll check the message ID and you'll find that it's already there in history and it's not going to be there. So, so that's one of the ways to put it. Right, so this has, uh, so, so we are getting away from the, the data layer. Uh, do you want to kind of ask any questions for the data layer? Because this is the networking layer, this is the last slide I have. So, can you trust the contribution based on age is interesting. Um, is that all? There is, is that the only strategy to be able to? It is one of the strategies. There are other strategies, but I guess the node aging is the one that we are saying prevents all that. Because at the but end of the day. Also, the fact that 
like a number of nodes would recognize another node and trust it. So in other words, if a node is trusted by a group of nodes, yes. you can assume it's a trusted node. So it's the only way you can gain a trust. So, so it's only the group of nodes that increment your age. So if one person says that, hey, I find this guy trustworthy, please increment the age, it won't happen. It's the entire group of 100, 200, whatever we have, have to agree that, okay, this person's age needs to be increased, and then for, and yeah. it's, a, it's a slow increase. There's consensus age. Is there just a consensus age? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's not linear. It's a, <laughs> like, reaching from age one to 10 might be easier than reaching from 10 to 11, kind of stuff, so it becomes like an algorithm. Can I ask a question about encryption? Yes. So, essentially, whatever encryption technique that is chosen on the network actually launch is, but we're talking about storing stuff in perpetuity. So, it's a fair to say to all the farm to assume that any encryption technique will eventually be compromised. I am not an expert in that. Is, but I but think like... My, my question would be, yes. is there a way that the encryption can be upgraded? It can be, but the thing you need to remember is, once you have the data gone to the network, you can never be sure that it is no longer there, right? One person just needs to keep the data somewhere in the hard disk for some reason, right? And your data is there. Now, even if you re-encrypted the stuff and upload it newly, that old data is still there. But I imagine if the, if the government was so interested in what you're doing, like the GCHQ or somewhere you are, if I say NSA, they'll probably start tapping on the computer here. So, they will track you, and they will try to store that, try to break that and all that stuff. And eventually one day, if, if, if the encryption algorithm fails, then yes, then that is compromised. But the thing to remember is, we are we are not kind of inventing an encryption algorithm, right? So we are using something that is a state of the art, which is done by a lot of other people, and is done by everybody. So if that breaks, it's basically the entire stuff will break. So we are not going to be the, the only people whose stuff will be corrupted or compromised, Everybody's suffering. I'm well, that's true. Sorry. I assume you are thinking like long term in terms of quantum yes. safe yes. photography for this network. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Because I think like uh, RSA, like especially when you make your SSHPs and stuff like that, you shouldn't add more blue one zero two four because I think that is uh, discouraged. I usually make like four zero nine six bits, which is supposed to be resistant for all that long term. But yeah, some advanced technology or maybe it's not even. Is there actually anything going so it could theoretically be upgraded in the future? The encryption algorithm? Yes. Oh yes, the entire network can be upgraded. Uh, well, well, then yes. my question, sorry, yes. following that would be, who or what would decide when and what to upgrade it to? That, that's and secondly, yes. all the data that, assuming this is probably quite a long time in the future, all the data that's encrypted using the old encryption techniques, mm -hmm. Would it have to be re encrypted? And sure, if it was a massive network, there would be a massive computational and um, what would do it? Yeah, but the fact is, if by the time that your encryption is no longer safe, you have quantum crypto, you know, quantum computers and they can re transcribe your data like that. So, no, yeah. quantum there's lots of encryption techniques that are quantum safe already. Uh -huh. So it's not. <coughs> but there might be something you else that isn't quantum computing. But you right? do ask a very important question because. Uh, the upgrade is notoriously difficult, but if you ask uh, David, the, the founder, what is the most difficult part, he'll probably tell me the upgrades, because upgrades in a centralized system is very easy, right? You go to the server, it's upgrades, and how do you upgrade a decentralized system that is autonomous, like everybody's thinking for themselves? So the way it will happen is, uh, this is just a guess, uh, this has not been worked out, right? Maybe you upload a new binary, maybe the main thing uploads a new binary, and enough people trust it, and enough nodes trust it, and they decide among themselves that we are going to upgrade now. Because everything needs to happen via group consensus, right? Yeah, so once you make a worm and set it off on the network, done. That might not be very <laughs> good for the reason it might collapse the network. Because if enough people go offline just to upgrade and then come no, on. It would, be, it would just, you know, a worm doesn't need to turn your computer off to install itself. Yeah, could be, could be. So, so you don't actually kill the binary, but you upgrade it while the binary is running. Yeah, and it, and it just crawls across the network and does itself. Yes. And yes. they can't stop it. Yes, in, in fact, that is one of the ways, because uh, when you kind of do anything, you require some kind of a message transmission, right? So when, when walls talk to each other, at some layer, there will be like some message transmission. 
and you will encode something saying that, hey, I have upgraded by the way, and if you don't understand this message, you need to upgrade yourself, right? And then you might go like, hey, okay, that seems to be a new binary. You might ask other people, have you upgraded, or is this a malicious guy trying to make me upgrade to some unknown binary or something like that? And if there's a group consensus, then you upgrade yourself as well. And so do everybody, and then that warm like stuff happens. Uh, as you say. Because th those are the techniques, because otherwise it's very difficult for a decentralized, non-controlled network to upgrade, right? So because there's no central brain thinking of it. What if different people come to different conclusions and decide to have different encryption techniques? Yes. There's a war. <laughs> like, yes. Now then again, I mean, your pods, they seem to be individually based on the algorithm of your choice. Right? You could, you could. Uh, but the thing is, I need to understand that, right? So if, if, if say for instance, uh, a wall is trying to communicate to some other wall, for the clients it's completely fine because you are the one who owns the data, right? Yeah. The wall is just dumb to store your data. So you can re-encrypt using whatever you want, right? But if a wall needs to communicate to some other wall, they need to be in sync about the encryption algorithm. So if this wall says, Algorithm X is brilliant for me, I'm not going to touch Y because I know it's flawed and if this one comes to a different conclusion, then you have a conflict. At that point, the majority needs, or the super majority. So whatever is the group consensus. So group consensus does not mean the entire group agrees. It is very difficult, in fact, for the entire group to agree for a very simple reason. You can control the nodes joining you, you can't control the nodes leaving you. Anybody can trust is setting up to those. So are we saying like, basically, all the node, like, deciding we need to update the encryption and there will be a point where the majority, more than 51% of all the nodes decide it, then it would be sent out across the whole network. Is it, so so, so it, it might be decided per group or network-wide. If it is decided per group, because a group will realize that a neighboring group, for instance, has upgraded, and if enough people in this group have realized, then some, something has happened. How would the groups communicate if one had upgraded and one had Sorry? How would the groups communicate if one had upgraded and one Oh, that is very simple. So, so you, you have a bad protocol, right? So we can break in a number saying that you, we are running at a network version 1 and there's a backup compatibility for, say, like X versions. Say that X is 1, so we, we just can, we are backup compatible for like one version. Then you go to version 2, you also know version 1 because you're not going to, because you are still backup compatible to one version, but you're going to say that I have upgraded to 2, by the way, and this is what 2 looks like. Right? And then people won't understand you because they are like, I don't understand too, and you need a one version. But if enough people go like, two does seem to be good because it brings in these benefits, that's how they're going to know and then they're going to upload it. Basically, if the data has got a, a version tag on it, then, for example, if, if you're in, in the group of nodes that have upgraded, your data, its address, its immutable address, should have a version number. And therefore, it won't be storable or compatible on nodes that don't upgrade. It depends on how the, the, the address is worked out, right? So the content is encrypted, right? But the address itself is worked out via a hashing algorithm. So if you change the hashing algorithm that produces a different kind of an address for the same content, then yes, it will go to a new place. But at that point, you're talking about the client data, which the network doesn't really care, right? Because as a client, you can change as, as soon as you talk about data, there's client data. Network has only network level messages. Like routing needs to know who joined, who left, whose aid I need to increase and all that stuff. And that does not really have an address as such like the client data. That does have a destination, but that destination is your cryptographic key. Now if you change the cryptography and you come up with a new key, then yes, it still knows you. Maybe you're located to some other place, but it can still reach you. So, so yes, this is kind of bad. That's why it shouldn't happen all at the same time, otherwise there will be a network collapse. So it right. should go like slowly. Skype did that, by the way. Skype launched an upgrade, because Skype is also peer to peer. So it launched an upgrade and everybody upgraded, and then that their community went down. So, so everybody had to kind of log into Skype by going to their centralized server, and that kind of lost the centralized server. Yeah. Yeah, and so I might add to, to that question about like the quantum computers and all that stuff. So um, if we're talking about data at first, and if we are like, uh, if we imagine that now like there, there is uh, this thing, that quantum computer that can decrypt the data that it already exists and that is already encrypted and you can see like what is inside, uh, it wouldn't be really like 
uh, a big change for the same network because the data is stored not in its entirety, but uh, most of the time the, the large files are being chunked. Sure, so, yeah. that's yes. another security. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so basically if you're running the vault um, and, and you have this piece of data, you can't really decrypt it because it's not the whole part of the data. And no, and, it's, not, and it's homologically encrypted, so you need all the chunks yes. to sort right. it out. And you, and, you can't, and you can't know uh, at which addresses and at which vaults the other parts are stored. And you can't know well, what those other parts actually are. So it makes it really difficult to decrypt this data even if you have like these that is like one so hundred percent. Even if the encryption was broken, the amount of stuff you'd have to observe to work out to connect stuff, and assuming that this would be quite, it'd be quite a big network, would be incredibly yes. more yes. complex. You wouldn't just need the hashing algorithm to go down from the code that you would need to. Amazing, so it's like, like you've got to find all the chunks, yeah, assemble all the chunks. Similar to normal. But normal. the thing is, like, uh, so at, at that point, yeah, we might as well say that the security is broken. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't personally say that because it is difficult to find all the chunks. It is still secure, it's not what I would say. Yeah. At, at the point when the encryption is broken, I would basically say your data is no longer secure. Yeah. Because we don't really know what the capabilities out there are, right? So if, if we are kind of running an NSA kind of a thing, we have the powers of supercomputers, it might not be difficult for them to kind of find out what all the chunks are. So, so that would be security via obfuscation or something like that. Or this is a strong, right? Security via obfuscation. Uh, security through obscurity. Obscurity. Yeah. Security through obscurity is not really a security. Yes. Yeah. It's just in your mind that yeah. I've done something very secure, but it's not that mind to prove the words. Okay. So this is uh, about the networking layer. We had something called cross. Uh, by the way, do, do you guys kind of, uh, or did you guys follow when uh, they say that a layer called cross, which is connections and cross? Pass. Right. So the crust was connections in Rust, that was a networking layer, right? We switched over to something called Quick, uh, which was initially developed by Google, and then it became an IDE standard. Google had their own version of Quick called GQuick. It's a parallel evolving technology, and Quick is like evolved or kind of adopted by the, the, the wider community. There's one time Google was trying to be all of all, all this. So we, we have gone the Quick route, which basically stand, uh, I'm very bad with that, but it's sort of probably this Quick UDP, Internet connections or something like that, right? So it is something on top of UDP, which is a user data ground protocol, which we know is not reliable, it's not ordered, uh, things can get lost, and it does not have congestion control and all that stuff. Uh, Quick basically adds all that stuff to UDP. So now you can imagine that it's almost become similar to TCP, but then it doesn't stop over there, it goes further, right? And in Crust, we used to do things like multi streaming. At Okay, I'll, let me just explain what multi-streaming is. Uh, stop me if, if you already know these things, right? So multi-streaming is a single stream means, imagine there's a ticket counter and there's a line, so the person and the, the ticket counter is only serving one person at a time, right? So normally, by a ticket, probably 15 seconds. Let's say the person in front is very invisible, wants to know what station, what blah, 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 doesn't understand the language probably, needs a translator or a picture, right? So it's taking half an hour. But what that means is your 15 seconds job is just going to get stuck because of this guy who is spending like half an hour trying to do that. And that is single streaming. And that is what happens in TCP. If you send a huge data followed by small data, the small data can only reach the destination once the huge data is completely reached and acknowledged. Right? So, so what multi streaming does is whenever something like that happens, you can just imagine a new window comes up, a uh, ticketing window, and suddenly the queue moves over there. So this gentleman or lady can spend or half an hour over here arguing with the person, while the other people who have these 15 second jobs can keep going. And then if you require more windows, then more windows occur, right? At the back end, everything is the same. It is the same destination, like they're all doing the same ticketing stuff, and the same database is getting updated and all that stuff. So multi-streaming is, Exactly the same thing. It prevents the head of the queue blocking, so there's a head of the queue, and it's taking a long time, so it prevents the entire queue. So it prevents that by dividing into some logical streams. So we used to emulate that. Uh, I don't know the difference between simulate and emulate, but one of those terms, whichever is the correct English. Right? We used to do that in Crust, uh, but that had a lot of boilerplate. Uh, so Quick kind of does that, 
and the protocol level. And remember, like Rick is an IETF standard, right? So IETF is so Internet Engineering Task Force. Right? So I mean, that design uh, DCP and all that stuff. So, so it is being looked after with them. <laughs> so they'll do the right thing. Whereas our stuff would be kind of just looked after by us and maybe a few other people who are interested, whereas this is the entire world is coming in, right? So it's good to take things as, as the ecosystem evolves. So now it has Quick and it has Quick and Rust and we coded Rust, so we uh, adopted Quick. It has encryption for free. It crossed TCP no encryption. So we had a separate library of ours which used to do encryption and then if somebody asked how do we do encryption? I have to explain them. Okay, we do this, we do that, and then they might not. And the security experts, they might not. But what about that? What about that? And stuff like that. So now we don't have to explain anything because all we need to say is quick does encryption, it does TLS 1.3. You have problems, go to TLS 1.3, discuss with them. Right? At that point, the whole world should have a problem because everybody's using TLS 1.3. So, so that, we get that for free. So you can see the amount of stuff that it reduces as boilerplate and our maintenance hassle. So which means that we can be more productive in things that may it actually requires like rooting there and maybe the data types and other things. Whereas these things which are already a solved problem, we can just adopt them. So that was the reason why we chose Quick. Uh, the, uh, the, the main important point, and this is for me the main important point, is it lives in user space. What I mean by that is the TCP and the UDP are the base level protocols that are built into every kernel. Like my Linux kernel will have a TCP and UDP stack. If you use Windows, Mac, it will have some type of stack. Any change to that is obviously going to take a humongous amount of time because the entire operating system community has to change it and a lot of other people. If something lives in a user space, you can change it whenever you want, right? Much faster. So Quick lives in the user space because it does not alter the UDP, which lives in the kernel space. Right? It alters something that is built on top of the UDP, so it's just like an application, any other application. And applications can change very quickly, right? So, which means the progress will be uh, many fold compared to TCP. Right? Uh, and that's why like, in TCP the progress was so CRUST is originally implemented to operate in kernel space. Sorry? Was CRUST originally implemented to operate in kernel space? Not at all, because our applications are it, 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 it would have been in the application there. Right. Okay. So we cannot implement anything at the kernel space because then we need to go to each of the kernels of all the operating systems and tell them to do it, which would be like very unfeasible. Okay, so that's the reason why we done. that's something I needed to uh, make clear. So that's how we do the networking at this point. If anybody has any questions, I'm going to through this thing. Thank you. No, I that time, so there's nothing else to do. So, hey, today, what was the time you skipped over about keys? Sorry? About two slides back, there were some key types that you skipped over. VLS keys, yeah. VLS keys. So, these are important for whenever you have a group. If you just have to prove yourself, for instance, and how do you prove yourself in the digital world is you sign something, right? You have a private key, you sign something. I have the public key, everyone has the public key of yours, that's why it's a public key, and we can verify the signature, and therefore you prove that, yes, I am there. So in that case, uh, usage of any of the ordinary cryptographic keys, like uh, the electric curve keys and, and uh, the RSA keys, those are enough, right? And as long as you have asymmetric encryption, anything enough, which is uh, a standard, it's enough. But what if you and somebody else needs to co-own the data? Right? And I, as a third person, need to understand that you made a request, hence it is valid. He made a request, hence also it is valid. Both of you made a request, hence it is valid. So then you might have further uh, complications or uh, more constraints saying that, okay, we five own the data, but please make it valid. Only three of us or more sign it, something like that, right? Fair enough. Or you might just say, like, if any of one of us signs it. So there's some kind of a threshold you allocate to it, right? So over there, the BLS keys will shine because it's, it's a part of DKG, it's what you call it distributed keys integration. Uh, so in that, what happens is the keys that you own, the keys that somebody else owns, and the keys that somebody else owns, all have come from a pairing function, something about a pairing function. And they're related, right? And the, the effect, the, the, the end effect of it is, if you combine all the public keys, 
it creates some kind of a master public key. And if you combine all the private keys, it creates some kind of a master private key. That's called a master private key, master public key. Master public key is easy to find out, right? Because I know all of your public keys are combined in some way mathematically, and I know the master public key. Master private key is impossible to find out by for anyone because you don't know his public key, as sorry, private key, he doesn't know your private key, so you can't just combine the private key. But the good thing about that is, and that's why those uh, the other stands for like the three authors of that. So, and the reason why those guys are teammates is, is without anybody knowing each other's private keys, if you sign via your private key, somebody else signs via their private keys, if you combine that, it is almost as if somebody had signed using the master private key and hence verifiable via the master public key. So that's brilliant stuff, right? You don't know the private keys, but still, you sign, you sign, and I can verify it using the master public key. So you say you can do an encrypted conversation without actually exchanging the keys? Without exchanging the private keys. So, so that, that's, the, that's the marriage model for people. Right? So, so, and, and it's so complicated. You can sign contracts, like several people can sign contracts without exactly. an outsider knowing who was involved or any of the insiders that are, you can do with the quorum of the insiders but the insiders wouldn't even know each other's public yeah, exactly. yeah, they wouldn't know how they yes. either. Exactly. So all they can do is, I signed it, you sign it, please, you sign it, please, you sign it, please, and now suddenly it's verifiable by our combined public keys. Though nobody knows our combined private keys. But everybody can know our combined public keys. And you can, uh, the good thing is you can associate, or you can assign thresholds to that. So you can say that if any three of the five sign it with their private keys, you can combine all the public keys and still verify them. And you can set that threshold to any number from one to four. So that, that's the BLS. So we are changing over to using BLS keys. In, in, so, so if you go to this link, you basically have the data type laid out over there because this is the GitHub uh, link to our latest design. Uh, the, the owner field of it or the permissions field of it will have BLS keys and just one key because uh, that's the BLS master public key. So now you don't even require like a lot of public keys to represent uh, this data is being owned by the key people, for instance. You just require one key, which is the master public key, which can verify everybody's signature if they combine it and uh, they meet the threshold criteria. 